the language of the book was what kept me going through mm-hmm. it. I, I, I really think that he has a, a knack. With, and being a sort of a small-time writer myself, it, it really is uh, difficult to come up with, with phrases that are new and refreshing and so forth. Like, he had a few that I, I noted down here. And one of my favorites was called Bambification. And it's the mental conversion of flesh and blood living creatures into cartoon characters possessing bourgeois Judeo-Christian attitudes and morals. And I just thought of all the Disney that I had seen and so forth. And and this other one you choose between pain or drudgery, which is a, I think is a, quite telling. But my favorite of all was they have this scene where the world is ending in a sense and they're sitting in the supermarket of all things waiting for the glass to implode and so mm. forth and he's he says that your minds become the backlit norad world map of mythology mm. and all i could think of was all the times that you've seen you know the norad map in the background with a missile uh, mm. the you know where yes. the missiles will come from and so forth and it, i just thought it was it was classic yeah, the descriptive passages in the in the text itself are, are remarkable, a lot mm. of them. Not necessarily how people would speak in, uh, right. in everyday conversation, but uh, taking a look at some more of these neologisms, Hannah, did any of these stand out for you? Could you, re- could you relate to them, or did they seem a bit dated? Um, I could relate to quite a few of them. Uh, you know, certainly the sort of mid-20s breakdown that he talks mm. of and how people are feeling that now that they don't have the structure of school and family, you know, they're perhaps headed for disaster, and ultimately this fear that you will end up alone and be very lonely trying to navigate all of this on your own without this structure resonated uh, quite a bit with me or the idea of uh, another one is rebellion postponement the idea that there may be all these things that you want to do at a certain point in your life but there's this pressure to maybe get a good resume building job and so you you put these things aside but you know he sort of warns that horrible things will happen to you in your 30s you'll have you know bad outfits and silly haircuts and be very sad for your lost youth. So It's all true. Yeah. Um, so certainly those two uh, stood out quite a bit. Stephen? Uh, well, there's all a, of these must have hit a little part of your soul like they did to me. Yeah, there's, there's so many gems in there. Um, you know, the, uh, the veal fattening pen mm-hmm. that he uses to describe sort of cubicles and the environment and, uh, you know, in the corporate world where, you know, people are sort of, you know, Questered away in these these little spaces, so I thought that was that was a good one. Uh, another one was down nesting, which was the tendency for uh, you know once children sort of move out of the home, um, the adults will buy a smaller home so that the that their kids can't come back and, and live with them. So I thought that was good. Um, and another one was just this this notion of mental ground zero, which yeah. is uh, the you're talking about you know you know nuclear explosions and things. It's it's visualizing where you would be when that would happen. And, you know, it more often than not tends to be, you know, in a, in a shopping mall somewhere, which, you know, which uh, I think is an interesting comment on sort of society at, mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah, the new, the new town square, right? Yeah. Expatriate solipsism when arriving in a foreign travel destination one had hoped was undiscovered, only to find many people just like oneself, the peeved refusal to talk to said people because they have <laughs> ruined one's elitist travel fantasy. <laughs> Ouch, right? Yeah. We've probably all been there. Um, the language in the book itself, do you want to, can you talk about that a little bit, Stephen? How did this read to you, just as a novel, as, as, uh, as a sit down and, and uh, have a good night, spend a good night reading? Well, it, it was interesting because, I, again, not really knowing what to expect going in. And, you know, essentially they, they just start telling stories about themselves and about the future and about, you know, things that could have been or should have been. And so it, it took me a while to sort of to get warmed up to it. But after a while, I sort of felt myself sort of drawn in to some of these stories. And, you know, they're very, you know, fantasy. And I'm like, how did they come up with this stuff? It's just, you know, being stuck in a, you know, a certain year. I think it was 1973 or something. There was, you know, the, the, the story about, you know, the astronaut. And so just it sort of really just pulled you in. And the, the book didn't really take you on a journey so they didn't really go anywhere except through their stories they took you different places which i thought was uh, was quite entertaining copeland has talked about that he says that the idea uh, was that people marooned in life like the characters could maroon themselves could unmaroon themselves by talking to each other yeah through telling stories and at that point um, he was uh, said that this was a way of dealing with information overload was just by sitting back relaxing and telling each other stories 
Hannah, that was information overload in 1991, okay? We had, <laughs> what, 12 channels and we thought we were ahead of the curve? How much more applicable do you think that is now when it's non-stop, inescapable information? I think that people do still turn to stories and they want to hear about things that can bring you to another place or teach you about something different, but maybe in a slightly less formal internet kind of way. I, I don't think that storytelling is on its way out or even storytelling amongst friends that, you know, that can, I mean, even the fascination that we have today with blogs and these still kind of, we're looking for more informal sources of information amid all of these newscasts and media updates and all of these different tweets. Yeah. Treats, we're just assaulted with them. But I think that the idea of, of a storytelling with a very satisfying kind of beginning, middle, and this is what happens. I'm trying to describe this uh this phenomenon and i think there's still quite a quite an appreciation for that today i think this this idea of stories and so forth is sort of central to the book because i i really think that we all want our lives to be a complete story and i think what he was pointing out is that with with the sort of mind-numbing work we do the compartmentalization of everything the the uh, right now, you know, we see all of the corporatization of everything. You know, the guy holding up his skis and so forth, and yeah. and it's trying to take all these disjointed pieces and make our lives into some meaningful story. And I think I think that was a, a really interesting sort of central theme. Of course, no one ever talks like they do in books. I, I wish my friends were as. Uh, <laughs> You know, could, erudite, yes, erudite is that. But but at the same time, uh, I I find it quite compelling. I was I was quite uh, impressed by his yeah. by his dialogue. Dialogue is very di difficult to write. 